In this lesson, we'll do a quick comparison between animals and single-celled organisms like amoeba. Here we see a dog up here. This is a multi-celled organism composed of somewhere on the order of a couple of trillions of cells. In contrast, the amoeba and the paramecia down here are single-celled organisms. Now, the amoeba and paramecia live in watery environments. Of course, the dog is a land dweller. Here we see a dark field image where the organisms are illuminated from the side as opposed to underneath the slide. So the background looks dark and the organisms look bright. Now all cells on Earth, including animal cells and amoeba and paramecia, have an external boundary, the cell membrane. So all living cells on Earth have a flexible membrane. And this not only defines the cell with respect to the outside world, but it also keeps all of the contents of the cell together. And should that membrane rupture, that can spell death for the cell. And here we see in this scene, the amoeba's membrane here has ruptured. A cytoplasm is leaking out. And when this happens, then the chemistry of life cannot occur properly within the boundaries of the membrane. In fact, all the contents of the amoeba here, we see some dead paramecia that have been digested to various degrees will escape. But of course, they're not going to live another day because they've already been destroyed by digestion. Nevertheless, the amoeba was alive a moment ago, and now because of this rupture, that's a fatal wound, uh, it will die. So animals are multicelled, but they are composed, of course, of, of lots of small units that we call cells. Uh, and they, they're stuck together to form different tissues and organs. Here's going to be our cartoon of an animal cell. And it's similar to the one that we drew for amoeba. So we've got an external boundary. That's the cell membrane composed of two layers of lipid molecules. Uh, in this case, there's a nucleus, a nuclear membrane, and DNA is within the nucleus. And then we've got all these different proteins doing different jobs in the cell. And here we see the mitochondria as well. We've got transport uh, proteins on the membrane in order to get food and uh, nutrients into the cell and deliver waste out of the cell. The proteins inside the cell are doing all kinds of different jobs. Some of them are going to be uh, metabolizing food, and some are going to be building important molecules. After all, cells are made from molecules. So the first system we'll take a look at here then in our comparison is to note that the dog is going to, when it eats, it's going to digest its food in the stomach and the intestines and then absorb the nutrients into the blood. Well, the circulatory system, here's the heart and all the big arteries and such, the circulatory system will deliver those nutrients to all of the body cells. Now, the arteries take blood away from the heart, and they will branch and branch and branch into smaller blood vessels, as seen in these pictures here from the tail of a fish. So the real small blood vessels are called capillaries. Here we see some larger blood vessels in this picture here, but now we're getting, for these two pictures down here, we're, we're seeing some very small blood vessels where blood cells, red blood cells, have to travel in single file fashion through these blood vessels. It's here where very important processes take place. And we saw this diagram before in our studies. The red blood cells will be delivering their cargo of oxygen to the body cells and picking up the carbon dioxide waste. But in addition, since the dog just ate, there will be a whole bunch of nutrients being delivered by the blood to the body cells. So the blood is carrying two categories of important substances, oxygen and all the nutrients from a digested food. Now inside the dog's cell then, uh, those nutrients are going to be used to do important uh, uh, metabolic reactions. So every uh, cell in the dog's body is close to a capillary. So it's going to be getting nutrients and oxygen. The food will be transported into the cell, food like glucose. Glucose will be uh, destroyed, will be metabolized the final process taking place in mitochondria. And that chemistry requires oxygen, oxygen, which was also carried by the blood. So the blood is delivering uh, two very important categories of materials. Nutrients, some are energy molecules, some are building materials to build various uh, cell molecules, and oxygen needed for glucose metabolism. The uh, animal cells are going to burn the glucose to get energy. Well, 
Uh, amoeba also have to get nutrients from their environment and they do so by eating other living things. So amoeba uh, have these extensions of their cell membrane. They use them to crawl, but also to capture prey and uh, covering these pseudopods uh, on the surface of the pseudopods all over the cell membrane are protein receptors that can detect the presence of prey in the environment. So amoeba can move towards its food. Here we see up top a, uh, a series of pictures showing the growth of pseudopods. These are the extensions of the cell membrane in such a way that it can trap its prey. Now we learned in previous lessons that we can think of uh, living cells as machines. They have a whole bunch of working parts. The parts are proteins. And in this scene we have microtubule proteins can stick together to kind of lengthen a pseudopod. The chopper proteins can chop them to shorten a pseudopod. But if the receptor proteins detect chemicals from the prey, the receptors block the choppers, which means the microtubules can only get longer and that moves the pseudopod towards prey. And that's very useful behavior. Here we see another scene then of uh, amoeba effectively using its pseudopods as weapons to capture food. Now here we see then the formation of a food vacuole. These two pseudopods are going to join together and form a membrane bound chamber called a food vacuole. Here we see a nice look at two paramecia trapped in a food vacuole. The idea then is in this scene is that here we have our food vacuole. The living paramecium will be digested and turned into a whole pile of useful nutrients. Then those nutrients will be delivered into the cytoplasm of the cell. So what separates the food vacuole from the cytoplasm is the membrane of the food vacuole. Now in the food vacuole then, here we see a couple of uh, food vacuoles here, two trapped in one here and then one paramecia trapped in another food vacuole here. What's going to go in, on in the food vacuole is digestion. So a team of proteins are going to begin to tear apart the paramecia and uh, produce lots of useful small molecules that we'll just call nutrients. Now we drew a more complicated scene in this picture. Up top we see the amoeba is capturing a paramecium here. The pseudopods will join and that will form a food vacuole. And then another little uh, membrane bound bag of digestive proteins will fuse with the food vacuole. Here we see a magnification of that scene down here. Uh, these digestive proteins come in different varieties. Some of those digestive proteins can break the chemical bonds between amino acids, so can digest the paramecium's proteins. Uh, some of the digestive proteins can break carbohydrates into individual sugars like glucose. Some of the digestive proteins are specialized to break down DNA into the four chemicals called nucleic acids. Lipids will be disassembled, etc. And all the nutrients will be transported out of the food vacuole through these uh, transport proteins. And we call that absorption. So the paramecium is going to be turned into a bunch of useful nutrients that have to get out into the cytoplasm where they can be used for further chemistry. Um, one of those nutrients, glucose then, so the dog has eaten the carbohydrates in the food, will be digested into simple sugars like glucose. Uh, the dog cell will import the glucose and a team of proteins will begin to tear apart glucose. That's the beginning of glucose metabolism and the whole point of that is to get the energy, release the energy that is stored in the chemical bonds of glucose. The final metabolism occurs in mitochondria. So the dog is doing glucose metabolism and specifically all the dog's cells are doing glucose metabolism to get chemical energy and that energy will be used to power lots of other chemical reactions as we'll see in a moment. Well, uh, amoeba and paramecia also do glucose metabolism. And we drew the picture like this. Up top, we have our amoeba. Here comes glucose out of the food vacuole. It's going to be attacked by a team of proteins, beginning the process of breaking those chemical bonds to release energy. The final uh, breakdown happens in mitochondria. That chemistry does require oxygen. CO2 is waste. And the whole point is to take the energy that was stored in glucose and repackage it into molecules called ATP. ATP. They have useful quantities of energy for cell chemistry. Well, as we said, that chemistry required oxygen. In the case of the dog, then, the dog is equipped with lungs. So the dog will inhale the air, and the oxygen in the air will make its way into the blood. In our circulatory system over here, we see the heart, of course, and up here are the blood vessels in the lungs. So the blue blood that is low in oxygen is going to pick up a cargo of oxygen and go back to the heart, and the left side of the heart will pump it around to the body. Um, uh, now that 
process then, of course, has to uh, keep going for the life of the animal because all of the dog's cells require oxygen to metabolize glucose. But let's look at the lungs a little bit more closely. Uh, here is a diagram of the lungs, sort of a cut away here. We can see these chambers, the air sacs, and this is where the inhaled air resides. Uh, surrounding the air sacs are blood vessels, the capillaries here. Notice there's blue blood entering the lungs, and then the red blood cells down here in the bottom left are going to pick up the oxygen from the inhaled air. At the same time, carbon dioxide is released back into the chamber, and then we will exhale that CO2 waste. So we have gas exchange going on in the lungs. Here is a cross-section of lung tissue over here, and they look like rings of tissue here because the uh, air sacs, when you slice an air sac, you're going to get a ring of lung cells. So these are uh, multiple lung cells that make up these air sacs that hold the air that we inhale. Um, of course, then the circulatory system is going to deliver the oxygen uh, by way of the red blood cells carrying the oxygen. So the oxygen will be delivered to body cells. And here down in the scene, again, we see the oxygen entering the dog's body cell uh, for the purposes of glucose metabolism in mitochondria. Um, here we see some red blood cells that actually there was a, a, a small rupture in a blood vessel and some of the blood cells leaked out of the blood uh, vessel and so we see some blood cells here but these would be responsible for carrying the oxygen now the, here we see some human blood here and in fact the red blood cells are clumping up in the picture in the top here we see some of these white circles those are white blood cells here we see a more even distribution of red blood cells but there's a white cell in the middle here so the blood has these two kinds of cells that we call them blood cells but they're very different let's take another look here this would be a red blood cell here and uh, one that was just kind of twisting in the solution on the side. Here's one over here that you can kind of see its shape. It's sort of like a donut in a way, but there's no hole in the middle, but it's kind of disc shaped. And then this other one here is a white blood cell. And we should note though that they have very different functions. The red blood cells are carrying oxygen and the white blood cells are part of our immune system. Here we see a white blood cell sort of crawling along and, and some of its membrane got stuck on something on the slide here, surrounded by red blood cells. Now, uh, amoeba and paramecia also require oxygen because they're filled with mitochondria. A big amoeba might have a thousand mitochondria and oxygen uh, is dissolved in the water in which they live and that oxygen can pass easily through the cell membrane of the amoeba and the paramecia and find mitochondria for the important chemistry that occurs there. Uh, and the waste CO2 also then just leaves the cell back out into the water. So these organisms live in watery environments, and water can contain certain levels of dissolved gases. Oxygen is one important dissolved gas. Well, now, what is the uh, animal going to do then with uh, the uh, energy from burning glucose and the nutrients from food? Well, animal cells are going to use those materials to build things. So we have... Uh, glucose, a source of energy entering the cell. We have other nutrient molecules like amino acids and lipids and nucleic acids. And the cell then has teams of proteins that can use the simple nutrients to build more complicated molecules, the very molecules that make up cells. Well, that kind of building process requires a constant supply of ATP energy. So the ATP molecules are carrying just the right amount of energy to donate to the builders, the construction workers here, other proteins that are building important molecules from the nutrients uh, that they get from food. So if we think about these single-celled organisms, it's the same kind of deal. Up here in the top left, we have a big old stentor captured by an amoeba. So the stentor is being digested here. And so the idea is the amoeba is going to repurpose the stentor's molecules to make them amoeba molecules. Down here, this amoeba, the silvery thing here, has captured a stentor and lots of paramecium. And again, what, what amoeba do, what animals do, they take once living things and turn them into dead things and specifically chop them up into bundles of useful parts because the, the very uh, parts that the paramecia and stentor are composed of are just the kinds of parts that amoeba would love to possess. So what we've got then is we've got a bundle of nutrients in the food vacuole, or soon to be nutrients. We've got ATP being produced by lots of mitochondria around the cell. And those two are gonna be used for the construction projects.
And we drew that in our scene up here. Here's our amoeba, and we've got nutrients from the food vacuole. We've got lots of ATP from mitochondria, the metabolism of glucose, and we've got the team of workers. So the uh, uh, the enzyme in this case, a protein that's going to do a chemical reaction, is going to bind the the nutrient molecules, and they're specialized to just do this one chemical reaction. A chemical bond will form between the two nutrients, and that requires energy. So ATP is going to deliver the energy needed for this protein to kind of change its shape and shove these molecules together so a chemical bond can form. And then the, the finished molecule will detach, and the enzyme is ready to go again. Now the spent energy molecule, the ADP molecule, will have to go back to the mitochondria to get recharged with more energy to become an ATP molecule again. So this is what cells are doing. There are thousands of different kinds of construction workers, these proteins that do specific chemical reactions, all the chemistry needed to keep the cell alive. Of course, uh, animals, as we know, do uh, export waste in the form of pee and poop. Uh, and this is because uh, cells uh, have waste materials. So the nitrogen waste from the metabolism inside the cell will leave as urine. And then undigested food will leave as the poop. Uh, so animals have to export waste because Animals are made of cells, each, each of which is also exporting waste. We're going to get rid of CO2 in our exhalation in the lungs, and we're going to get rid of some of the nitrogen-containing molecules in our urine. Uh, Single-celled organisms have to get rid of waste as well. Carbon dioxide just moves out across the membrane into the water. Uh, other kinds of liquid waste can be squirted out through these chambers called contractile vacuoles. And finally, uh, we'll note that animals uh, have the capacity for reproduction. Uh, the males make a specialized sex cell called sperm cell, and the females make egg cells. And of course, the whole uh, idea in reproduction is to get the sperm to meet the egg to form the next generation. Now, in the case of the dog, in the male body, the tes testicles produce the uh, sperm cells, and the ovaries in the female body produce the eggs. In this organism, sea urchin, it's difficult to tell the males from the females um, until they sort of release their sperm cells or egg cells. So in this case, we'll pretend that this is a male here, and here's a picture of sea urchin sperm under the microscope. Uh, here we see the two big eggs here, and we notice the size difference. In fact, in this scene here, we see a sperm cell that has just sort of fertilized the egg, and here's another one down here, just made it in. So this is the moment of fertilization. Obviously, the size difference is apparent here. The female eggs are generally much larger than male sperm cells. Here we see in another species of sea urchin, an unfertilized egg on the left, and this one has just begun to be fertilized. Now we know this because there's this membrane that seems to be rising up. The purpose of this membrane is to block other sperm entry so that only one sperm cell gets in. If multiple sperm cells get in, they're carrying too many chromosomes and there will be abnormal development. Here again we see unfertilized egg up top here, and now we see the full extent of the fertilization membrane. So it completely surrounds, in a three-dimensional way, the egg. Now this fertilized egg then will go on through the process of cell division, and we call that early animal development. So one cell will divide into two cells on the left here, and then two cells will divide into four cells. And so we have the early stages of, of uh, animal development. Here we see in yet another species of sea urchin, one cell, two cell, four cell, etc. And this picture here is a picture of a multi-celled uh, embryo. So this thing is kind of swimming around in the water, uh, and in time it will develop into the mature animal, either the male or the female. Now one cell can make two cells, and two cells can make four cells. If we go back to our cartoon animal cell, that's because inside the nucleus are molecules called DNA. And this critical molecule has the capacity not only to store the recipes to build all the proteins of the cell, but this molecule can be duplicated. And this is what allows for living things to reproduce. So when uh, the cell uh, duplicates its DNA, um, for example, in this scene here, the cell has duplicated its DNA, and then one copy of the DNA goes to one cell, the other copy goes to the other cell, and that will uh, make sh give rise to two cells, each of which has all the recipes to build all the important proteins for the chemistry of life. Now, in our, the case of the amoeba, we drew our picture up here. We, we uh, noted that there are lots of different proteins that are doing different jobs and keeping the amoeba alive. And here we were trying to relate these proteins to DNA. What's the relationship? Well, we now know that the DNA molecule stores the recipes to build the proteins. 
So this particular stretch of DNA has the recipe to build this particular protein, the one that builds molecules. And we have to remember, though, that proteins are composed of subunits called amino acids. And each kind of protein has a unique sequence of amino acids. This chain will fold up into a unique three-dimensional shape, and that shape determines the function. So the, the builder here has a different amino acid sequence than the uh, the receptor protein on the surface of the cell. You can see the, the different kind of uh, sequence of amino acids there. And that gives rise to a different shape, and the shape determines the function. Well, each of these sequences of amino acids is specified by the corresponding gene. So there's a gene for this protein, and there's a gene for this protein at a different location along the length of the DNA. And what we'll see then, as we study DNA more closely, is that the DNA molecules compose of these four chemicals, abbreviated A, T, C, and G, and it is a chain molecule. So there's a sequence of these four chemicals as well. And we'll be learning that the sequence of these DNA chemicals is a code for the sequence of amino acids in a given protein. So when uh, the amoeba is ready to reproduce, it's going to copy its DNA and then deliver one set of DNA molecules to one of the daughter cells and the other set of DNA molecules to the other daughter cell. Uh, and the cell will then, the cell membrane will pinch off and we'll have two separate individuals, each equipped with all the information they need to survive. Now, one interesting consequence of DNA duplication here, we see an amoeba up here and it's uh, got DNA in the nucleus. Um, when it duplicates its DNA, sometimes mistakes happen, and they're called mutations. And this means that the daughter cells, right, the daughter individuals, might be different in virtue of this uh, different sequence in a particular gene. And that alteration in the DNA sequence might affect the protein that that gene codes for. Now, oftentimes, uh, there are more ways to get messed up than to be better. Oftentimes, the protein will, will not work as well, might not work at all, in which case this individual is not going to have as good a chance of surviving as the other. But sometimes these mutations create new proteins or better proteins, and then this individual might have an advantage in the struggle for life. So the fact that uh, when DNA is copied, there are these mutations, that sets up the situation where there's variation in offspring, and we'll see as they struggle for, for uh, surviving, this sets up an evolutionary process that Mr. Darwin will teach us about. So DNA is a really important molecule. It stores the information to make proteins. It can be duplicated. And when duplicated, sometimes changes occur. And that change in, uh, in DNA sequences can give rise to the possibility for evolution. So that completes our comparison then of an animal and these single-celled organisms, there, there's a lot in common. So a lot of what animals are doing, uh, single-celled organisms are doing, because animals are made of cells just stuck together. Of course, the notable difference is that animals, being multicellular, the cells are organized into tissues and organs that are each doing specialized jobs to keep the whole animal alive, like we have the digestive system and the circulatory system and the respiratory system and the um, reproductive system, etc. Whereas these single-celled organisms, they have to do everything that it takes all just by being a one-celled organism. So they have to get food, they have to digest the food, absorb the nutrients, they have to build stuff and get rid of waste. All that type of stuff is happening in just one cell. Whereas in multi-celled animals, the cells are arranged into organs, each of which is kind of performing important functions that keep the whole animal alive.